Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Interim Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Bill Maurice, the President and CEO of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. This is our weekly discussion with Dr. Maurice, in which we learn about updates in the field of laboratory medicine and pathology. Bill, welcome back. Good to see yeah. you this week. Yeah, good to see you too. I guess welcome back to both of us. I think both of I us know. have been traveling, both been traveling a lot. Where did you just come from? I was actually on vacation last week. Oh, good so for you. I was in Kentucky seeing thoroughbreds and distillery. <laughs> vacation and time to yourself is very important. Yes. Are you coming back with a, for, a refreshed outlook on life? Yes, I am actually in many different ways, I guess. that uh, All I can say is if you're someone that has a hard time getting away from work, uh, spending some time doing tours of any kind is probably a good idea because you're, you really have to get on the bus and literally and get things going. So yeah, it was very, it was a refreshing, um, it was a refreshing vacation and now back at it. Yeah, well, I feel the same way. And of course, we're starting to see some snow melt in Minnesota. So that's nice too. And uh, we could talk about what that means for the area I study, which is vector borne disease. But maybe we should do some uh, broader updates first on what uh, is going on in the political realm and oversight in lab medicine and pathology. Yeah, well, so as spring uh, obviously comes, uh, you know, legislation, the federal legislation back in session. And so, uh, and getting active here with a new newly minted members of Congress who were elected last November. So a couple of things that we're seeing. One is that there, uh, people should keep an eye out the SALSA bill, which is the uh, Saving Access to Laboratory Services Act, um, will probably be reintroduced sometime here, even in the next couple of weeks. Um, it has bipartisan support meaning both sides, both, both the Democrats and Republicans, and we have, there are sponsors for the bill, um, but it's really important for people to be aware of that because it, if it's, it's gonna face an uphill battle to get passed because it does involve more healthcare spending. So, but advocacy is really important. And so uh, you can go onto the American Clinical Laboratories Association website, or just put in, I think it's Stop Lab Cuts Now. It's basically a, a, a website that people can kind of log uh, you know, uh, log their their desire to to see this uh, protection really of access to testing by making it sustainable economically. Um, so that's one thing I think people really, for all of us in lab medicine, have to stay aware of. So, and it'll be interesting how all these things go because, as I mentioned, there is a new Congress. That means that there are new um, new members of Congress and new uh, existing uh, Congress people who are in influential positions. And one of the most influential in healthcare is actually the Senate Health Committee. The H stands for healthcare. I think it's employment and labor, uh, the, the E&L, but, uh, but that is now, it was chaired by Senator Murray from, which, from, uh, from Washington State and with the ranking member being Senator Burr from North Carolina, who was always a strong advocate for laps um, as a Republican. It's now gonna be chaired by, Senate, by Senator Bernie Sanders. And so, um, you know, he is very much passionate around the making sure that healthcare access is is protected, and that there's not overly uh, there's not an overly heavy influence of, of big business or industry in healthcare. So we'll just have to see. It'll it'll be interesting to see how this impacts. Um, maybe not labs as much, but could well be as we look at that act. So those are kind of the the big things to look for. I think there there will continue, and then of course FDA um, as and the pandemic preparedness are the other big legislative issues, FDA probably not so much, but certainly pandemic preparedness and what a, what a bill might look like around that. And I know we had even our own Dr. Binnaker um, out in Washington, D.C. last week, I think in the National Academy of, of Sciences uh, conference on this. So those are, we'll see a lot, uh, I think, here in the, in the coming months. I agree, Bill. I think that we should all keep an eye on what's going on. This is going to impact all of laboratory medicine and pathology. You mentioned ACLA's website. I'll throw in there CAP, uh, College of American Pathologists website and advocacy has a lot of great information. So I would encourage everyone listening to just go to either website, click on the links, find out what's going on, some opportunities for advocacy. Again, very important to our field. Yep. It makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. It actually does. And we learned this last time. That was part of why we were able to get the extension uh, of the, at least preventing the cuts of, of PAMA was because there was so much advocacy from a number of groups, but a lot of the grassroots effort, whichever ones are accessible to you, 
really do do go a long way because people are worried about getting elected and reelected. And speaking of advocacy, this is an area where as pathologists, laboratory directors, laboratory scientists, it's really important we get out there because we're not typically patient facing. People may not understand what the pathologist does, what the laboratory does, why laboratory medicine and test results matters, and that there's actually medical leaders that run these labs. So in a way, we have a larger challenge than perhaps some of the patient facing specialties because we have to educate who we are and what value we give and then advocate for things such as reimbursement and uh, preparing for the next pandemic. Yep, indeed. And we go on and we have before and I'm sure we will yep. again. But... There will be more in the future as the, you know, the new Congress does its work. But in terms of advocacy, the other thing is, what things should we be worried about here as we come into spring? You know, I was down in Kentucky, it's already green. Um, yeah. The leaves coming out on the trees up here in Minnesota it still feels like we're more, it's, you know, not so green yet, but I think that as the leaves come out and as the grasses grow, uh, other things start to become uh, material for us as well from a lab perspective, right? Absolutely. Uh, those that know me know I'm interested in vector-borne diseases, so the rule of thumb is when the snow melts, the ticks, and then the mosquitoes come out. And so if you are going outside and enjoying our new warm weather, you do have to remind yourself and your family members to take precautions, uh, especially with tick bites early on. That's when we're going to start seeing um, the ticks waking up that have overwintered. Ticks can even overwinter in a place like Minnesota, and then they come out and they may already be infected. So if they bite you, they can transmit something like Lyme disease, babesiosis, um, even non-infectious things like we've talked about before, like alpha-gal syndrome. So you have to remember the general precaution preventative measures that we talk about for preventing tick bites. Yep, and I, I think to your point, I mean, first of all, my sense is that they're in part, we're, we're just now aware of these, these illnesses that you can get from vector-borne, uh, you know, like ticks, but from vector-borne illnesses, I should say. But the other is that they're with, uh, they seem to be spreading. There's areas that are becoming more, they're, they're more pervasive than they were in the past. Is that right? It's absolutely true. The ticks are spreading their geographic ranges. We're seeing ticks advance into areas where they weren't present within the past several decades. With them uh, uh, spreading new diseases. There was a recent report uh, in EI or in uh, the CDC's MMWR dispatch, Babesiosis. It, uh, it's a parasitic disease transmitted by deer ticks or black-legged ticks. That's now all the way up into Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire. Those are three states that weren't considered endemic before. Now we have to consider them endemic. So Lyme disease is still our number one tick-borne disease in the, in the U.S., uh, an estimated 476,000 cases each year. So by far our number one disease, but then there are all these others. And then we have new tick-borne diseases like the ones we've discovered at Mayo, Borrelia mayonii, or Lichia miris oclarensis. So a lot of reasons to avoid tick bites, Bill. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Not to mention they're kind of creepy, but <laughs> yes. um, you know, I do think it's uh, for people to remember, number one, from a lab perspective, a lot of these illnesses are not if you're not aware of the tick bite, it can be very difficult to diagnose. I mean, we heard that from our own uh, patient story, the Mayo Clinic alumnus who had the alpha-gal syndrome. And, you know, I think he had a many-year journey to kind of figure that out. Uh, and so it was really through his, you know, finally getting to the right person. So I think on the lab side, as you think about guiding the use of tests, um, making sure you're working with clinicians to make sure they're aware of it, uh, these diseases, and that they think to test for them, and then for all of us to really think early, as soon as we're out, we think of ticks being when it's in the summer, but the reality is, to your point, they're out there now, particularly in, in other parts of the country that are already warming up. And so you have to protect yourself. Um, and, and that includes, I think, not just yourself and covering, you have your ABCs and all that stuff, which are great. Um, but I think one of those too, um, as I think about it, having terriers, which of course, the name for a terrier dogs going to ground, right, from the Latin terra, um, that our pets can also be uh, important make means right now. They're out there rummaging around and they can bring ticks in as well, right? Absolutely. And they can get tick-borne diseases too. So this is a good time to bring your pets to the vet if they're going to be outdoors uh, or get the treatments for them to prevent tick bites, repel ticks. Um, they can bite the ticks or the pets. They can also bring those ticks inside and then they can bite your family members or you. Yep. So, uh, okay, well, so back to at least it's uh, something we should be aware of. 
all of us, right, in terms of prevention and also diagnosis. So, and an important role, really important role for the labs. And then we'll get into the mosquito-borne illnesses and, and some of that, and, and then we'll have to watch what comes. I mean, we think about COVID uh, as the pandemic, but I, I still remember what the first thing that we were dealing with when I became department chair in 2015, shortly thereafter was Zika. So yeah, Zika virus thing, transmitted yeah. by mosquitoes. And then of course we still have outbreaks of dengue virus. And then we have lacrosse and um, various forms of encephalitis, Powassan virus cases are going up. So yeah, maybe I'll just refresh uh, and we can finish up by talking about the ABCs of tick bite prevention. A is avoid the areas where ticks are. Although if you are an outdoors person, you know that may not be a, a great measure. And so if you can't avoid the areas where ticks are gonna be, make sure you B, wear your bug spray, and C, cover up exposed skin, less areas where you can get bitten. Yep, yeah, that's right. Important to remember all the time, not okay. just midsummer. So, yep. all right, well, it's good to have you back. It's good to be talking about things uh, like that we should be talking about, uh, like uh, preventing tick-borne illnesses and all those things. And uh, as always, great talking with you. Yeah, you too, Bill. More updates to come. Have a great week. You too. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.